Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Tato. I'm Lee Godden, Dean of the Faculty of Law at Teharenga Walker, Victoria University of Wellington. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the 2023 Robin Cook Lecture and a special welcome to all of our distinguished guests tonight, uh, including representatives of the Cook family. The Robin Cook Lecture is the highlight of the Law Faculty's event calendar and it commemorates the life of the late Lord Cook of Thorndon. Robin Cook was an alumnus of this university and is widely considered New Zealand's most eminent jurist. He is the only New Zealand judge to have sat in the House of Lords in the United Kingdom. It's my pleasure also to welcome our guest speaker this evening, Professor Jason Burroughs. Jason is Professor of Law at Melbourne Law School and Senior Crown Counsel at the New Zealand Crown Law Office. It's particularly appropriate that Jason gives the lecture tonight as also an alumnus of Victoria University Wellington, having completed his LLB ONS and his BA economics degree at the university and indeed having commenced his academic career at Victoria. Jason is the founder and director of the International Series of Public Law Conferences. He is also, we're pleased to say, Senior Research Fellow at the New Zealand Centre for Public Law at Victoria University of Wellington. Professor Varahas was previously Director of the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies at Melbourne Law School. He has held academic positions at the University of Cambridge, University of New South Wales, and visiting positions at Oxford, Yale, and McGill Universities. He was recently elected a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Law. Earlier in his career, he was Judge's Clerk for Justice Mark O'Regan, who um, is here tonight. Professor Varahas has published widely in the fields of constitutional, administrative, human rights, and private law including leading treatises on administrative law, torts and damages. His scholarship has been cited regularly by courts across the common law world, including by the New Zealand Supreme Court, High Court of Australia and UK Supreme Court. He has made significant contributions to law reform, including most recently reform of the English judicial review procedure. His doctoral thesis, and I think there are some analogies with uh, Lord Cook here. His doctoral thesis was awarded the York Prize at the University of Cambridge, as I said, a distinction shared with Lord Cook. And the ensuing book, Damages and Human Rights, was awarded both the UK Society of Legal Scholars Burke's Prize for Outstanding Legal Scholarship and the Inner Temple New Authors Book Prize. With that sort of a background, I think our speaker is eminently well-placed uh, in relation to the topic of tonight's lecture, the future of public law in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Please join me in welcoming Jason. In a nui, in a rahi, te in a tato, katoa. In a mate, hairi atu ra. Et a hau kainga, te in a koto. In a rangatira, te in a koto. Et a fine al cook, te in a koto. Et a herena waka, te in a koto. Ko Jason Varuhas aho, no kiriki, no te fanganui atara. Hoki aho, nao mai, haere mai, itaku koho. Good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, Lee, uh, for your very kind uh, introduction. And I'd like to acknowledge the Cook family. I'm delighted uh, that you're here with us um, tonight, and also my own family. Um, as Lee mentioned in her introduction, I hold a number of roles which tend to keep me well occupied. Uh, this evening, I'll be speaking in my academic uh, capacity. It's a great honour to deliver the Robin Cook Lecture. Uh, it has special meaning for me 
for several reasons. Uh, Victoria University is my alma mater, and this lecture theatre and the lecture theatre next door are uh, where I first learned the legal craft uh, taught by many here uh, in the room uh, this evening. Wellington is my hometown, and so it's special to deliver this lecture to an audience, uh, which includes family uh, and so many long-standing friends and colleagues. And of course, it's a privilege to deliver this lecture in honour of Lord Cook. My lecture tonight will address the future of public law in New Zealand with a particular focus on judicial method. And those are apt topics for a lecture in honour of Lord Cook. I recently had occasion to read the Privy Council decision in Erebus, decided in 1983. Lord Diplock, sitting in London, observed that while there were some procedural differences, the principles of judicial review in New Zealand were the same as that in England. Now, the claim was dubious at the time, but today, no one would even think of making such a claim. And that's in large part because of the changes affected by President Cook and the Cook Court through the 1980s and 1990s. Building on what had gone before, President Cook and his court put in place the essential building blocks of a distinctive public law for Aotearoa. It was through that period that the Court of Appeal issued many administrative law decisions now viewed as canonical. The court was confronted in 1990 with the Bill of Rights Act uh, and went about forging the beginnings of a new human rights jurisprudence. And the court issued a series of totemic decisions on tetidity, the lands case being the one that towers uh, over the legal landscape. In terms of judicial method, Lord Cook's judgments twins a deep understanding of the law's bedrock commitments with a remarkable deafness of touch, characteristic of someone who was master of their craft. And whether or not one always agreed with particular cases or arguments that were advanced in his extrajudicial writing, one could always respect the craft, the mastery of legal reason. And so it's appropriate that this lecture should take as its topic the future of New Zealand public law with a focus on judicial method and legal reason. It's a good start. So New Zealand public law is on the move. Over the last five years, we've witnessed a significant wave of legal development led by the Supreme Court. Change has not been confined to one facet of public law. Rather, there's been significant change across a number of public law fields, including the Common Law, Bill of Rights, Treaty, and Tikanga. These changes have occurred within a concentrated period of time. They have marked constitutional implications for the present and future of New Zealand public law. The developments reflect a concern to fully realise a vision of a distinctive public law responsive to the New Zealand context. And the developments are also reflective, I think, of a Supreme Court establishing its place in the broader constitutional order. So this lecture takes those changes as its starting point. So I'll begin by summarizing the case law developments over the last five years, and I'll then move on to my main focus, which is judicial method. The current phase of legal development serves as a prompt for an exploration of judicial methodology and specifically the role of values in legal reasoning. My motivating concern is noting that New Zealand public law is on the move to ensure that the judicial methodology by which legal change is affected is constitutionally appropriate. If the method by which change is affected is sound, then the developments themselves are likely to be viewed as legitimate and therefore capable of withstanding the pressures of the day and the test of time. If the method by which change is affected is unsound, 
then the developments shall be open to critique as illegitimate, have a precarious status within the legal system, and be liable to reversal by government or a future court. The lecture is not a critique of particular decisions or doctrines. It's about something more fundamental, more basal in nature, and that it's concerned with the way in which judges reason to outcomes and the way in which they develop the law, the judicial method. So it takes the present phase of legal development as a prompt to make a future-looking argument for a particular approach to judicial decision-making, which will help to secure the legitimacy of the advances made. As such, this is a lecture on the nature of legal reason made in the context of public law in Aotearoa. So, turning first to the developments over the last five years to provide some context for the discussion of judicial method, uh, in the Bill of Rights context, the Supreme Court in Taylor asserted the jurisdiction to grant declarations of inconsistency where statutes are found inconsistent with human rights, this power being recently exercised in the Make It 16 case concerning the voting age. The case of Fitzgerald marks an apparent reset of the interpretive approach under the Bill of Rights, and Moncrief Spittle made some progress towards explaining the approach uh, or how the Bill of Rights applies in the context of uh, discretion. In the treaty context, the Trans-Tasman case seems to have established a presumption that statutes will be interpreted consistently with treaty principles, while more generally, the courts have increasingly intervened in matters before the Waitangi Tribunal and the treaty settlement processes in cases such as Ngāti Whātua Oraki and Warapa Moana. Arguably, the most significant decision over the last five years is Alice, which followed on from previous cases such as Takamore and which seeks to address the interrelationship between tikanga and the common law. At common law, we've seen the rise of the principle of legality, which aims to ensure that statutes are interpreted consistent with basic common law norms. And in regard to international law, perhaps most notable is the rise of campaigning environmental litigation in which plaintiffs seek to convince courts to enforce environmental standards derived from international law against governments and private corporations with the court cast as a type of environmental regulator. And we wait to see how the courts will resolve those interesting claims. Now, much can be said and has been said about each of the developments described. In a nutshell, there's a lot that's going on. Uh, and my interest today is in a golden thread uh, which runs through this um, emergent jurisprudence. And that is the rising prominence uh, of a discourse of fundamental values or principles. Judges are increasingly re uh, reasoning by reference to values. These might be common law values, human rights values, Treaty of Waitangi principles, tikanga values, or values derived from international law. And values here are defined as ideas. Values as ideas tend to be broad, abstract, and open textured. So for example, in the treaty context, these ideas include partnership, participation, and good faith. Human rights values include dignity or equality. Common law values include physical integrity and liberty, and institutional values such as the rule of law and separation of powers. And tikanga values include mana, hara, and utu. The current phase of legal development is at an early stage and could proceed along a number of different trajectories. And that is why now is the time to consider the proper place of values in legal reasoning, and specifically the proper place of values in judicial decision-making, so as to ensure the modes of reasoning employed are legitimate 
we need to ensure that legal development proceeds on the right footing. And the way I propose to analyze the issue of judicial method is to set out three different models of judicial reasoning, each of which give values a different role. Now, these models are presented as ideal types, but in developing them, I've been informed by modes of adjudication observable in comparative case law. Critical reflection on each will help us to, to identify which model uh, we ought to favour. So the three models in summary are first, legalism, a mode of reason which largely rejects any role for values in legal reasoning, and which I would associate with a persistent majority of the High Court of Australia over the last 25 years. <laughs> Second is uh, normativism. Now, this is an adjudicative model within which values take centre stage. So on this approach, cases are determined by courts balancing values on the facts of the case, a model which has increasingly taken hold in Canada and which was beginning to take hold in the United Kingdom until a recent course correction by the UK Supreme Court. The third model is common law reason. Now, within the common law model, judges decide cases on the basis of reasonably determinate, detailed rules or principles. And in turn, these rules and principles are manifestations of deeper values. So in each of these models, values play a different role. Now, I'll argue that legalism and normativism should both be rejected. Legalism is an impoverished form of legal reason which risks adjudication becoming unmoored from any idea of what law is for. And normativism raises serious legitimacy concerns because it tends to collapse any meaningful distinction between law and politics. So I say the path forward lies in the common law method, which has stood the test of time for good reason. And setting the common law method side by side with legalism and normativism helps us to more fully understand the common law method and appreciate its comparative advantages. So I'll start with an account of legal reason in the common law tradition before going on to consider legalism uh, and normativism. And in the best of academic traditions, there are a number of concepts to be introduced. So fundamental to understanding orthodox legal reason is a distinction between detailed rules and principles that operate at the surface level of the law and on the other hand, the law's deep lying commitments. So what I would refer to as first order propositions or norms are the detailed legal norms on the basis of which judges decide cases. So these might be called rules, principles, doctrines, or tests. So for example, the improper purpose doctrine or the irrelevant considerations doctrine in judicial review, or doctrines of causation and remoteness in the law of torts. So these rules and principles provide the legal as opposed to the factual basis for why cases are decided one way or the other. Now, lying beneath these surface level rules and principles are the deeper commitments of the legal system, which can be referred to as second order propositions or second order norms. Now, these deep lying commitments stand behind, explain, and justify first order propositions. So, first order propositions can be explained as detailed expressions of second order propositions, or put another way, deeper commitments are concretized in or mediated through detailed rules and principles. So for example, the rules of natural justice, such as no bias and knowing the case against you are first order propositions. 
and underpinning those propositions might be said to be a deeper commitment to dignity. So this deeper commitment provides the reason or the justification for why we have the rules of natural justice. So giving a person notice of the case against them and giving them an opportunity to be heard is to respect their dignity as human beings possessed of agency. Identification of second order propositions in turn imbues the first order propositions with further layers of meaning. We see the hearing rule in a particular light once we understand it as a manifestation of a deeper commitment to dignity. Now, these second order propositions are sometimes referred to as values. I prefer the notion of deep lying commitments as it makes clear that second order propositions are sourced from, from within the closed order of the law. They are commitment, commitments of the system concretized in particular ways within the historic order, not ideas floating somewhere out there in the ether. But if it, even if one conceptualizes second order propositions as values, the proper or accepted role of values in common law reasoning is as deeper commitments which underlie and are manifested in more detailed first order rules and principles. And indeed, it's by studying the first order rules and principles and the patterns that they form that one is able to derive or interpolate the deeper commitments that inform those rules and principles. So to give another example, the common law's deep historic commitment to the protection of property manifests an illegal right to exclusive possession and the allied action of trespass to land with its de detailed architecture, which includes per se actionability, strict liability, defenses, and damages rules. So the common lawyer doesn't go to court and plead the general idea of property as a philosophical precept tabling John Locke. One goes to court and pleads trespass, addressing the detailed elements of that action. But the reason we have the trespass action is because of the common law's deeper commitment to the protection of property. Trespass is a manifestation of that deeper commitment. So this distinction between first order propositions, the detailed surface level rules and principles, and second order propositions, deep line commitments, helps us to understand the nature of the legal categories with which we're so familiar, such as judicial review, contract law, court law, equity, and so on. Legal thought is organized according to these categories or units. And each of these categories represent a cluster of detailed rules and principles that are unified by a common purpose, unified by a set of deep lying commitments. So if you think about the rules of contract law, and it may be painful for the public lawyers uh, to have all this private law, but if you think of the, uh, if you think of the rules of contract law, offer, acceptance, uh, consideration, and expectation damages, these are all grouped together under the category of a contract um, because they all um, share a common commitment to the protection of promises. And similarly, all of the norms collected in human rights law, such as free expression or the right to life, are grouped together in human rights law because they're unified by a shared commitment to protecting the most basic aspects of human well-being. Now, there's coherence in these categories in a substantive or deep sense, in that the detailed rules and principles collected in each category are bound together by a shared purpose. Coherence here is not a merely formal quality. It is a manifestation of rationality and rational ordering. A legal system would be marked by irrationality 
if the way it was ordered was random or revealed no logic. Similarly, a legal system would be marked by irrationality if the detailed rules and principles worked at cross purposes with the law's deeper commitments, if the detailed rules didn't match up with or connect with the deeper commitments. So together, first order and second order propositions form a cohesive framework within which legal questions can be resolved and on the basis of which the law can develop and evolve. The more determinate rules and principles provide reasonable guidance, so law can provide and perform its vital role of guiding conduct and providing a basis on which people can plan their lives. They provide a determinate and persistent set of tools on the basis of which disputes can be framed, argued, and determined. They act as a kind of lingua franca for the legal community. And in a sophisticated legal system, most cases can be resolved on the basis of those detailed norms, the first order propositions. But second order propositions are constantly operating in the background, shaping how the rules and principles are applied. When it comes to developing new rules, a court will first ask what rule would fit or cohere with the surrounding first order rules and principles. Most cases of legal development can be resolved on that basis, i.e., would the new rule be intelligible when set alongside the pre-existing rules? But in the sorts of hard cases that come before higher courts, consideration of neighboring rules and principles may, may not be capable of resolving the issue. And that's where the deeper commitments come to the fore. In these hard cases, the law's deeper commitments provide navigation lights. They channel and discipline legal development. New developments need to be capable of rationalization as against the basic goals of the system. And in the vast majority of cases, new developments are outworkings or extrapolations from the pre-existing system in light of new factual situations that come before courts. So overall, one can understand the legal system as a giant mosaic made up of thousands of tiny tiles. The tiles are the first order propositions. Grouped rationally, they form discernible patterns. And when a new tile is added, it must be placed in such a way as to conform to the pre-existing pattern. Now I'm going to return to the issue of legal change and development at the end of the lecture. But for now, I think that's a sufficient sketch of legal reason in the common law tradition. And I want to move next to contrast the orthodox common law model with a possible rival from across the Tasman Sea, which I term legalism. So the defining feature of this model is that judges are generally uninterested in the deeper commitments of the legal system. Common law reason involves an interplay between first order and second order propositions. In contrast, the legalist mode is focused almost exclusively on first order propositions. Values, which would in traditional common law reasoning represent deep commitments, have little or no role in judicial reasoning. So for example, the judgments of a persistent majority of the High Court of Australia over the last 25 years have demonstrated marked resistance to zooming out from the detail of first order norms to consider the deeper commitments of the legal system. This trend's reaching its nadir over the last six years. So some will argue that legalism is an inevitable function of the particular Australian constitutional context. But while context certainly matters, that legalism is inevitable in Australia is falsified by the fact that past High Court Chief Justices, such as Sir Gerard Brennan and Sir Anthony Mason, understood 
that judging on an apex court required engagement with the law's bedrock values. As do judges of the current High Court, but who have been in a minority in terms of their judicial method, such as Justices Gordon and Enelbin. Put simply, there's nothing in the Australian Constitution which demands judges employ an impoverished form of legal reason. Now, you might ask why a consideration of legalism is relevant to a lecture on the future of our public law, given the trend within our Supreme Court is towards a discourse of values. Our justices don't seem at risk of falling into a legalistic method, quite uh, the opposite. Uh, I want to, but um, the reason I think it's important to consider legalism is I want to give a complete account of available models of reasoning. And I want to make clear what I'm not arguing for. But there's a further important reason to consider legalism. There are patterns observable in comparative case law that where courts push values-based reasoning too far, this can lead to strike back from government, which then leads to courts overcorrecting by resorting to a legalist model. And that is a caution to bear in mind for a court experimenting with values-based reasoning. And I note that in a response to the New Zealand Supreme Court's recent case law, there was a recent article in the Post newspaper entitled, Judges Beware, a Black Letter Law Day could be coming. So the central problem with legalism is that such reasoning proceeds on the basis of a radically incomplete understanding of law. One can't claim full understanding of a rule without understanding the reason for the rule. One can't understand a field such as judicial review or contract without understanding the purposes that that field is constituted to serve. In other words, legalistic reasoning involves at best a surface level understanding of law. Um, and the impoverished nature of legalistic reasoning in turn leads to a whole host of problems. First, it leads to conclusory reasoning. Many judgments of the High Court of Australia proceed by setting out case law authorities and statutory provisions in excruciating detail. Then a legal conclusion or new rule materializes at the end of the judgment, but without serious operative reasoning. And the reason we see that pattern is because in the sorts of hard cases apex courts deal with, without an understanding of the deeper commitments of the system, the court will lack the intellectual resources needed to rationalize new developments or resolve conflicts between competing lines of authorities. This also helps to explain why Australian judgments are so long. <laughs> Now, if one understands the reason for a rule, one can cut to the heart of the matter. But absent such understanding, one shall end up disoriented and lost in the dense woods of first order rules and principles, unable to see the larger picture. Now, secondly, legalism is generally marked by a lack of transparency. As I've said, within a legalistic paradigm, conclusions often materialize, absent serious justificatory reasoning, like a rabbit pulled uh, from a hat. The reasoning is marked by leaps of logic or gaps because the court lacks the normative resources to fill in the blanks. And in turn, the failure to articulate the core premises of decisions will lead observers to speculate that the judges are pursuing an unstated ideological agenda. That instead of being led by the commitments of the system, the judge is instead informed by personal values. Now, thirdly, because of the lack of transparency in legal reasoning, it becomes difficult to hold courts to account. The scholar and everyone else is left to speculate what really lies behind given decisions or adoption of given rules. Moreover, because the larger structure of the law is never articulated, it's impossible to test judicial outputs as against a broader framework of bedrock 
commitments. And fourth, it's often assumed that one benefit of a legalistic approach is that whatever its disadvantages, it will promote the rule of law principles of certainty, predictability, and consistency. But the claim is implausible. How can the system be certain, predictable, or consistent when there is the absence of a larger framework of principle to discipline judicial decision-making and condition legal development? There's no articulated mission for given fields, so how can the decision-making within a field be joined up? How can courts ensure decisions are reconcilable with the pre-existing system if one doesn't know what the system is for? If we don't have an idea of the larger patterns of the mosaic, how will we know where to place the new tile to ensure the pattern remains coherent? Put simply, judges will lack a set of common premises for thinking about the law, which will in turn lead to different judges proceeding from a range of different and contradictory premises. One way to put this is that the law will be aimless or rudderless, lacking a sense of direction, and we all know that's a recipe for arbitrariness. Now, fifthly, and finally, without an understanding of the law's deeper commitments, judging shall proceed absent an appreciation of what really matters. It follows that within a legalistic model of judging, fundamental norms are at serious risk of being misplaced, neglected, or worn down. At worst, legalism collapses into judicial abdication. And linked to this, if we don't interrogate what ends the law serves, we'll be unable to judge whether the legal system is properly oriented to those things that matter most to us as a policy. So ultimately, absent a sense of what law is for, legal reasoning and decision-making will come to resemble an elaborate parlor game with no idea why the game is being played. So that's legalism. Um, now, at the other end of the spectrum, often set up in contradistinction to legalism, is a model of adjudication I term normativism, or perhaps unbounded uh, normativism. Now, this is a model increasingly in vogue with some courts around the common law world and championed by some sections of the academy. Now, I argue that normativism should be rejected. Normativism is often presented as a more enlightened, modern, or even progressive approach compared to legalism. But I'll show it suffers the very same problems as legalism, albeit those problems manifest in different ways. The model is effectively the inverse of legalism. So legalism is focused on the first order rules and principles to the exclusion of deeper commitments. Now, in contrast, normativism would largely do away with first order norms in their place values as deeper commitments of the legal system are elevated from the substratum of the legal system to now operate at the surface level of uh, the law. Now, within a normativist model, values are not concretized in detailed rules and principles, but rather form the direct basis for adjudication. So judges determine cases by identifying those values they think are implicated, apportioning values weight, and balancing those values to reach a conclusion on the facts. So legal reason on the normativist conception does not proceed according to rules and principles, but on the basis of very broad ideas. Now, our Supreme Court has not gone down this path, but there is a risk that it might, given the court's increasing interest in values-based reasoning. And as such, it's important to make clear the pitfalls of the normativist model and why it should be avoided. Values have a place in legal reason, but their proper place is as deeper commitments which manifest in detailed rules and principles. 
to mainstream, open-ended, case-by-case balancing will almost invariably lead to the judiciary's legitimacy being put in doubt. So what are the problems with the normativist methodology? So first, on this approach, it becomes impossible to meaningfully hold courts to account. If every case comes down to striking a balance, then critiques of judgments can be dismissed that on the, ba on the basis that while the critic would balance the values one way, the judges have simply taken a different view. And no one will be able to say one view is right or closer to the truth of the matter. The reason being that there's no persistent framework of norms against which judicial outputs can be meaningfully tested. Everything is continually up for grabs as everything depends on weighing broad values on the facts of the case. So as one colleague has put it to me, engaging with the law will resemble wrestling a giant marshmallow. It can't be pinned down. So this leads to the second problem, the law will risk aimlessness. Rather than particular categories of law, such as judicial review or negligence, being understood to serve a discrete set of defined goals, the normative priorities of each field may be reinvented from one case to the next, depending on the goals the court thinks carry greatest weight on the facts. Now, values-based reasoning is sometimes praised on the basis that it renders transparent the normative assumptions underpinning decision-making. But the fact is, it often leads to conclusory reasoning. Values are often invoked in lieu of proper justificatory reasoning. So we've all read judicial statements to the effect that the rule of law demands X, or what good faith demands here is Y. The value is a placeholder for justificatory reasoning that is never forthcoming. It's a label attached to a preferred conclusion. And when it comes to balancing, that is the weighing of the values, the final outcome will generally come down to a judgment call. The judge will simply see one value as exerting greater force on the facts than others. So the ultimate balance struck often lacks rationalization, and that is because it can't be rationalized as anything other than a captain's call. And in turn, it will almost inevitably follow that judges will be criticized for decision-making based on personal predilection. In contrast, when judges operate within a determinate framework of principle, they will be able to demonstrate that their decisions are capable of rationalization as against the constellation of detailed norms. The decisions will be intelligible as against a pre-existing framework. But in a normativist model, there is no detailed framework, just a soup of values. Now, normativism would be a tragedy for the rule of law. Judges are public officials who exercise the coercive power of the state. As state actors administering state law, they must abide the rule of law. And indeed, judges must be exemplars of the rule of law, setting an example for government and society as a whole. But in a normativist model, the rule of law would be in tatters. The legal system would be marked by radical uncertainty, unpredictability, and inconsistent decision-making. If, if what the law demands of people regularly comes down to how a judge value, balances values on the facts, then people won't be able to plan their lives and law will fail to perform its vital function of guiding conduct. We'll all be like sailors adrift on the high seas, but bereft of the equipment necessary for navigation. It will be very difficult to predict outcomes. That is because what outcome a court will arrive at will depend on what values they consider are engaged, how they conceptualize the amorphous ideas, the weight they apportion different values and how they strike balances. It might be argued that over time, patterns will emerge, um, which will facilitate predictability. But balancing approaches aren't intended to settle down. They're to be kept fresh for the next exercise. 
And as such, unpredictability and uncertainty are features rather than bugs. Now, it might suit judges to keep their powder dry for each new case, but it doesn't suit anyone trying to understand what the law requires of them. Under a normativist model, lawyers will prosper as everyone will have to litigate to find out what the legal position is in their case. But it's the rest of society that will pay the cost and some people can't pay. So inconsistency also will be unavoidable as different judges conceptualize values differently, apportion weight differently uh, to different values and strike balances differently. And a significant reason why normativism runs into these rule of law issues is because it eschews a detailed doctrinal superstructure of rules and principles which could otherwise provide reasonably determinate guidance, discipline decision-making, and ensure like issues are dealt with according to a common framework characterized by reasonable stability over time. Now, fifth, this sort of open-ended values-based reasoning is likely to lead to errors and sloppy conceptual thinking. So it tends to convert everything into a value to be weighed. But not everything is a value. Some things are absolute rules, such as parliamentary sovereignty. Parliamentary sovereignty is not to be weighed against anything else. It's the ultimate rule of the system. Similarly, a right is not a value. It's an entitlement held against another who owes a correlative duty of compliance. To treat a right as a mere idea, a philosophical abstraction, is to risk watering down fundamental legal protections. And that's arguably what's occurred in Canada, where the Supreme Court has transformed charter rights into charter values, with the result that charter rights aren't entitlements to anything, but mere factors for public officials to weigh up in their decision-making alongside myriad other factors. So as Beverly McLaughlin, former Chief Justice of Canada, has emphasized, the better view is that while values may inform the content of rights, it's the right itself that receives protection under the Charter. There are thus many reasons to reject unbounded normativism, but the most powerful reason remains to be stated. And that is that open-ended values-based reasoning is difficult to distinguish from political reason. When politicians debate in the House of Representatives, what they debate, or what we hope they debate, is the values they believe in, what values are most important, and how they strike balances. A pure discourse of values is a discourse of politics, not law. In turn, if judges embrace normativism, they'll imperil their legitimacy because it will be difficult to say in what sense their judgments are the product of legal reason. Their decisions shall not be recognizable as legal decisions. So where does that leave us? I say the judges should reject legalism, an arid style of reasoning that lacks an understanding of what law is for. And I say the judges should reject normativism, a form of reasoning that collapses the division between law and politics. The judges must navigate between their tw these twin perils, their task similar to that of the hero Odysseus, who had to navigate his ship between Scylla and Charybdis, one a terrible monster and the other a deadly whirlpool. So the path forward for public law lies in the common law method, a form of reason that is recognizably legal and which proceeds according to a framework of principle that is reasonably determinate and normatively rich. On this approach, the judiciary shall avoid the pitfalls of legalism and normativism and the legitimacy risks associated with each. The common law method isn't perfect. We know the common law has never been perfectly certain, determinate, or coherent. But the ideal of common law reason is what we ought to strive for. Now, importantly, 
Mine is not an argument against any role for values and legal reason. It's an argument about the proper role of these deeper commitments in legal reason and in the state legal system. Values don't form a direct basis for bringing claims or adjudicating claims. One doesn't go to court and plead an idea and ask for a remedy because something's been done which doesn't vibe with that idea. Rather, the role of values is that they inform the content and provide the justification for more particularized first order rules and principles. And it's on the basis of those detailed rules and principles that legal claims are properly made and adjudicated. In turn, this balance between an understanding of the law's deeper commitments in, combus, on combus, in combination with more particularized norms, which are capable of guiding conduct and disciplining legal decision-making, will avoid the pitfalls of legalism and normativism. As I say, common law reasoning is both normatively rich and recognizably legal. Now, there's no shortage of values, whether common law values such as the rule of law, broad ideas of human rights, uh, treaty principles such as partnership or tikanga values. Those are our basic normative resources, the basic building blocks of the system. The task for the higher courts going forward is to forge these broad ideas into a reasonably determinate, reasonably stable body of particularized rules and principles. Some parts of public law are clearly defined. Significant progress has been made in other areas of public law towards greater particularity but other parts of public law are in a state of development or need a lot of work. The task is not easy, but it is vital. A detailed corpus of rules and principles allows citizens and government to gauge what the law demands with reasonable certainty. Such a framework conditions and disciplines judicial decision-making and offers a basis for holding judges accountable for their decisions. It ensures compliance with the rule of law and that judges are an exemplar of the rule of law. And most importantly of all, for the legitimacy of the judicial enterprise, on the common law model, judicial decision-making will be defensible as based in reason that is recognizably legal. So, let me take a sip. So having addressed legal method in general, I now in the remaining time want to make a few remarks about judicial development of the common law, that is legal changes that are affected by the judiciary. So when judges and scholars discuss the principles that should govern legal development, legal change is often discussed as if there were one type of change. So people will say, change in the common law tradition has the following characteristics, X, Y, and Z. But change is not monolithic. Rather, there are different types of changes, and these different types of change have different implications and call for different approaches. And I want to distinguish three types. So first, there's ordinary legal development. That's where a legal change is an extrapolation of and reconcilable with the established legal framework. So this sort of change only involves change to first order or surface level rules and principles in a way that's reconcilable with deeper commitments. So for example, a rule might be departed from because it turns out to be incoherent. Uh, or a new exception could be established, or a new rule minted. All of these changes can be capable of rationalization in light of the law's deeper commitments. This sort of legal change accounts for the vast majority of legal changes and is entirely orthodox. The law develops in light of new social, cultural, economic, environmental, and technological issues which are placed before courts but there is continuity and reasonable stability as the changes are reconcilable with the basic logic of the existing system. Now, judges will generally be 
on sure ground in affecting such changes as these sorts of changes are accepted as orthodox and discernibly legal in character as they follow from the logic of the existing system. Now, sometimes judges might push the envelope by developing the law in ways that stretch the logic of the system. In such cases, the legitimacy may be put in doubt, but the judges may consider this cost is worth it, given the importance of what is at stake. Now, what I'd say about this is that courts need to ensure they carefully accumulate political capital over time so that when they need to expend it, they have something to expend. Now, ordinary legal development can be contrasted with another type of change, change to deeper commitments. Now, when it comes to this sort of change, time must operate slowly. Change is tentative, and when done properly, ought to be almost imperceptible over time. And there are two reasons for this. So first, if judges radically change the deep-lying commitments in one fell swoop, they're likely to create a significant disjuncture between all of the first order rules and principles, which were premised on the old commitments and the new commitments, which the judges have endorsed. And the result would be that the status of the detailed rules and principles would be thrown into doubt. They continue to exist, but their place is precarious because it's not clear they can be reconciled with the newly minted second order propositions. It's as if a rug has been pulled out from under the doctrinal superstructure. The legal system will be pushed into a state of significant or radical instability as people won't know what rules they can safely rely on. All rules become candidates for revision or reconsideration in light of the new deeper commitments. And that's why courts should generally not seek to affect paradigm shifts in single judgments. Now, the second reason courts must move slowly in relation to deeper commitments is because of the institutional limits on courts. The prompt for courts to adapt the deeper commitments of the system is generally that there have been changes in social norms, social values, or social expectations. The idea being that the law's bedrock commitments should not fall out of step with, the society, with what society considers to be important or right. However, courts aren't particularly well-placed to gauge social mores. That is why courts will only generally reshape the law based on social values, which have a degree of permanence and around which there's a significant degree of consensus in society. Courts have to be careful in this regard. Social phenomena, which might appear permanent, might turn out to be passing fads. There are dangers in judges simply mirroring society because social mores may be oppressive or whimsical. And judges need to be conscious that we live in an age of political polarization, where it's difficult to say there's a consensus around anything. And another reason for a tentative judicial approach is that other institutions, representative institutions, uh, such as parliament, are better placed to speak to social values. Now, this isn't an argument for the judges to close their eyes to the world beyond the courtroom, but it is an argument for caution when it comes to reshaping deep commitments, a caution characteristic of the common law tradition and which has helped to maintain the, the maintain judicial legitimacy uh, over time. Now, the third point I want to make is that there are some changes, some types of legal change, the judges can't make. So one example is that the judges can't unilaterally alter parliamentary sovereignty. Parliamentary sovereignty is the rule of recognition or grand norm of our system. It's the rule on which everything else depends. And it's a rule grounded in fundamental democratic principle. 
if the polity is to relinquish a degree of popular sovereignty, then it must be a choice for the polity. Another possible example is that there may be questions whether the courts are able to affect a fundamental change to the legal status of titiriti. The most obvious change would be for the treaty to be rendered directly actionable in state law. I think we need to think carefully about this as a judicial change. If such a change were to occur, there's a plausible argument that the process by which change is achieved should be one that itself abides the treaty principles. That is, the process would have to be characterized by partnership, broad-based participation of and consultation with Māori and society at large on a range of matters, including whether it's the principles or text of the treaty or both that should be actionable and who can bring claims. The proposed process for change might well be properly vetted by the Waitangi Tribunal. There's therefore a question whether litigation would be the right procedural form for effecting a change of such moment for our society and particularly for Māori. So that is the end of my substantive remarks. Thank you for your patience. Uh, but I want to conclude with the following point. Judging is not easy. Each day, judges have to make decisions which affect the lives of strangers, which affect important relationships in society, and which are of great moment for our polity. They have the heavy responsibility of upholding constitutional fundamentals. I have the utmost admiration for those who are willing to take up the mantle to serve the public interest in this way. And my remarks today have been motivated by a concern to maintain the legitimacy of the judicial enterprise into the future. I'm not the only one thinking about these issues. Many in our system are thinking about them, and I'm sure the judiciary is too. Mine is one contribution to the discourse, and I firmly believe we're most likely to reach right answers when we're all, as a legal community, engaged in rigorous and respectful debate and discussion of the big issues faced by the legal system. And so, as ever, the conversation continues. Nō reira e nā nui e nā rahi te nā tātou katoa. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'd like to call on uh, Professor Joel Tolon Rios, the uh, Director of the New Zealand Centre for Public Law, to give the vote of thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the Faculty of Law of the Herenga Waka, Victoria University of Wellington, it is my great pleasure to thank Professor Barujas for what was a truly excellent lecture. Professor Baru has, has reminded us that the persuasiveness of a judicial decision is not enough to ensure its legitimacy. It's not enough to guarantee that it will be accepted by other government branches, by other courts, and by the citizenry at large. This is particularly true, Professor Baru has suggests, in times of great legal developments. Unlike Parliament, whose decisions, no matter how major and or unwise, can always rely on that institution's democratic legitimacy. Such form of legitimacy is not available, at least not directly, uh, to courts. Where to ground the legitimacy of a judicial decision then? In the quality of its reasoning. But it cannot be any type of reasoning. Professor Barujas warns us. It has to be a form of reasoning that reflects the aims of the laws in question, and that is different from the kind of political reasoning that one would expect parliament to engage when adopting those very laws. The type of reasoning that is needed, Professor Barujas tells us, is a common law one based in, the, in reasonably determined rules and principles that express deeper commitments sourced from the legal system itself. 
we have been left with a series of important questions about the constraints on and the limits of judicial decision making, a topic that is not only more relevant than ever in New Zealand and other common law jurisdictions, but that Lord Cook had much to say about. Professor Baru has talk has just exemplified the best tradition of Cook lectures. He has given us a lecture that is both instructive and challenging, and that reminds us of the many contributions that Aotearoa's greatest jurist has made to this country's legal system. And I ask you to please join me in a final round of applause to express our gratitude.